Creative Loitering Podcast. It was a mess. They're in shock over there in New York City. I'm in Ohio with a lion. So, uh... <laughs> you can't have a lion. An exorcism was performed in a place as a cure, and then the state was billed like $12,000. And it led to an investigation of uh, the criminally insane getting out easily and pushing people into subways. To prove to ourselves that nobody gave a damn about anyone else, we would go to the park and stage these fake uh, murders, muggings and murders, and, and then uh, laugh hysterically when the cars would pass by that just witnessed the whole thing. So let's cut to part one with Al Gore. I was thinking about writing a book for several years, but it wasn't this book. It was about, I was going to take like a dozen stories I did for the New York Post, you know, uh, really interesting stories like buying a lion. Uh, I went out to Ohio, bought, bought a lion. It's with Tippi Hedren, the actress now. I did a lot of interesting stories, you know. Uh, yeah, you want to bought ask? Bought a lion? Yeah, I bought a lion, a lion out in Ohio. It's a long story, but it had to do with a, in Manhattan, they discovered a tiger in a, an apartment building. And it was uh, a big story. And I worked for the Sunday paper at the time. So I, my stories were like longer stories and they appeared only once a week. And uh, I came in Monday and my editors were running after me. Al, you, you know, we need something to come back with because we screwed, we screwed up. So what happened is while the Daily News was running with the Tiger in Manhattan story. The Post was running with Siegfried and Roy when uh, one of those guys got attacked by one of their tigers. They were still running that. And the Daily News had a front page amazing picture of this tiger, a cop on a, uh, uh, outside the window on a fire escape looking at the tiger, the tiger looking at the cop in the, from the apartment. It was amazing. And they had, they had killed us. You know, we're talking about co competition between the Post and the news, right? They killed us that day. Uh, and they came. So I was I was kind of the, the guy they, they went to at the time, you know, to fix things. So I was like, okay, I'll see what I can do. You know, what do I know about the Tigers in Manhattan or whatever? So, so I start digging in and I find out that, you know, there's 14 states where you can buy one of these animals just as a pet. There's no law to prevent it. You can just go ahead, buy it. Buy, buy a lion, buy not, buy a tiger, you know, buy a bear. Texas. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Ohio was the closest state that you could do this. So uh, I spent some time on the phone. I got in touch with the American Sanctuary Association. I got in touch with, they put me in touch with Tippi Hedren. And so basically we came up with a plan that, you know, I, and I, you know, I went to my editors with it. I said, well, we'll go out and see if we can buy an animal. And uh, if we buy it, Tippy Hedren will take it. She has a sanctuary in California. She'll take it and uh, she'll raise it to draw awareness to the problem that they have. These these animals are all over the place and they're dangerous and they get uh, they get big. They buy them when they're small. They think they're going to train them to be pets, but they're still wild animals and they will kill someone. And they, there are people being maimed and killed and then it's being found. The animals are being found on highways walking out to get, get away uh, or they get thrown out because it's too hard to handle or they get dumped into these sanctuaries which are getting overcrowded you know so so there was an issue so i said we could take this issue and do the big the big picture story right and then we could kick it off by going out to ohio uh, to one of these swap meets and see if we can buy an animal and send it to tippy Hedren. so my they signed off on the idea so next thing you know um uh, i'm with a photographer and uh, his name is mike safronsky and we were out in Ohio, and we went to a swap meet. They, they had, a, like, timber wolves, but they didn't have anything, you know, really exciting. So I found this place I had been talking to before, one of these animal sanctuary uh, places. Not a sanctuary, sorry. It was a guy who bred and sold the animals. So we, bought, we bought, ended up buying a, a, a lion from him, and uh, it became a, a really big problem. For, for everyone <laughs> because the lady who ran this all right so so we had the, we had the lion i'm trying to call my office they're not answering me uh finally get through then they can't believe that i actually bought a lion they're in shock over there in new york city and i'm in ohio with a lion so uh <laughs> you can't have a lion <laughs> well it was only like a, it was a cub it was small so so we check into the hotel in columbus and this is 
the sign on the door says no pets. And my photographer goes, what are we going to do? I said, well, this is not a pet. It's a lion. Exactly. So don't worry about it. And I had it in a little bag. I know. <laughs> you know. Uh, and so we went into the room. We stayed up all night. We took turns sleeping, uh, taking care of this lion. Tippy Hedren's vet said, listen, uh, we made an arrangement with this uh, sanctuary in Ohio. It's too young to travel. Uh, it may not make the trip. So bring it to the sanctuary, and they'll take care of it, and then we'll handle it from there. So we brought it to the sanctuary in Ohio. We didn't know that the sanctuary was connected with some crazy man who was connected to the Daily News. We had no idea. Right? We were just following the instructions of Tippy and her, her vet. He was the vet for Siegfried and Roy's animals, this guy. He's a you know, high-level guy, whatever. So we just you know, we felt we were comfortable with what he was saying. So we made sure the animal was drinking um, some kind of formula that we got from a tractor supply he told us to get. It's like a long story. So anyway, so we're feeding it all night. It pees on the bed, you know, but so we're like, oh, whatever. So we just got to get this thing to this place. So we get up early in the morning, and we go there, and this lady – is just beside herself. She wants to keep the animal. And she goes to the Daily News. I mean, this guy screaming at me on the phone. She calls the police. She pulls out a paper, says you can't move an animal this young. It has to be certain age. And uh, so I'm, I'm on the phone with Tippy. She says, just leave it there. We'll take care of it. Because we were going to take it back. Because the lady was so bizarre. And, you know, we thought she was dangerous and so and we saw the animals in her place and they didn't look healthy so we were like maybe we ought to just take this we had a vet with us in columbus the whole time so and we were t in touch also with this jack Hanna character you know you know him he's one of the uh, famous uh, wildlife adventurers he's, he's hooked up with the columbus zoo so anyway so we you know we thought we would just take it she wouldn't give it back she called the police so finally, we, we, we reached a consensus. We'll leave it with her, and we'll return back to New York. And then Tippy and she will work out getting that lion to her sanctuary. That didn't happen. This lady wanted to keep it. She went to the Daily News. So we were accused of buying a lion that was sick. And when we realized it was sick, we just dumped it on the sanctuary and ran away. The Daily News had no idea that Tippy Hedren was involved, veterinarians were involved, animal rights activists were with us when I bought the lion. Two of them were with us. So they had no idea what the truth was. So talk about fake news. So I became like this whipping boy for a few weeks uh, in the media. And my, my editors weren't happy with me. And I had to come off, you know, I had become a story and I had to back off my own story. It was just... Uh, but anyway, this law got passed. The final result was that a federal law got passed to prohibit the uh, interstate transport of these animals as pets. So something good came out of it. Uh, you know, I ended up with a, a black eye. The Daily News, they never ap apologized. They raised about thirty to forty thousand dollars with this phony story for this uh, for this uh, uh, sanctuary in Ohio. They do a retraction at all, or bury it, or what? No retraction, nothing. I guess because I was a comp competitor that I guess this is what you can expect. But you don't you don't get an I'm sorry. No. That's some fake, fake news right there, Al. It was pretty bad, but I couldn't say anything. You know, my hands were tied. Yeah. So but anyway, I don't know how we got into that story. But. Well, somebody was talking about that. They said there's more in captivity in Texas than in the whole world in the wild at this point. It's, it's certainly possible. Elephants. I mean, you, you, I mean, really, it's crazy. People, want, they think they can take these things home. It's like, no. You know. Elephant in Manhattan apartment. <laughs> yeah. That's the next story. Yeah, they're going to come through the ceiling for sure. <laughs> Tippy Hedren wanted this law passed, you know, and I wanted to get, I wanted to get my paper, you know, uh, my story out there and, and do something interesting with my job. So I bought a lion, you know. So, <laughs> But yeah, so did it get the, the attention in Congress? Yes, it did. <laughs> okay, it got it got people's attention, and and a, a change in the law was made. However, you know, uh, I'm not going to say it was right or wrong. I'm just saying it is it is what it is, and you know, we're we're looking at an age where people are conflating animal ownership with slavery. Uh, I don't know if it's equal. <laughs> The next generation of kids will never have that experience at the circus. They'll never see the elephant or ride mm -hmm. the elephant. Yeah. They just won't have that. 
Well, you know, that's interesting you mentioned it because this is part of the book where I talk about the lion moving. I don't know if you got to read that story yet. It's at the end of the book. At the Catskill Game Farm. But, uh, yeah, my son got to ride an elephant at the Catskill Game Farm. It no longer exists. But, you know, they had uh, elephants. They had dare, bears that danced. They had, you know, stuff like that. I guess you know, we'll see less and less of that, you know, which is sad in a way because it shows uh, humans – and animals interacting with each other, you know, it's it shows that we can we can work with each other and we can communicate with each other, you know. It may be limited in, in, to certain things like a bear dancing, or even elephants dancing, but um, there is there is some kind of interaction there. You know, we have, I guess, we have an idea in our minds that animals and humans should be, uh, except for domesticated animals, they should be totally separate. You know, we should have no interaction with lions or bears or any of that. I wonder how many kids decide they want to be a veterinarian or a marine biologist. They want to work with animals. Mm -hmm. They decide at a young age because of those experiences they have at those game farms and the circuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's part of the problem with, you yeah. know, why I moved up up to the country it was, you know, I was a a Boy Scout and and I was you know raised in Brooklyn. And I remember one of the first trips I took, it was with a group called the Neophyte Explorers, you know. So we we went um, we went up to Shattuck, we did uh, to see Mount Marcy or something. And, you know, we, we went to different places. But uh, the first trip I took out of the city, uh, we were hiking along and I looked up in the canopy of the trees. I thought it was so beautiful. I'd never seen anything like it. Just the leaves and the branches overhead. I had never seen it because I grew up in the city, Brooklyn. So... Um, the guy who ran it, his name was Walter Story, long dead, but uh, he was a local newspaper reporter, you know. And he, you know, he took up, he took these kids in like us uh, and, and introduced us to nature. And, uh, you know, he had a dog named Mr. David and we would go camping and, you know, the street urchins, you know, would go camping uh, with him. And he, he, would let, he would allow you to say any curse except for one, which is um, the, the, uh, the substitute word for defecation, okay? He wouldn't allow that word, but you could say any other curse. But, I, you know, when I, I realized, you know, was thinking about why does he allow us to say that? Uh, he just wanted us to be aware of how much we were cursing. He wanted us to be self-aware, you know, without being overbearing, without being, you know, uh, paternalistic about it. He just, he wanted us, us to just know we were cursing. And our cursing, you know, significantly dropped by that technique. And I, and I, I appreciated that, uh, especially when I got older and had time to think about what he was doing with us. You know, he was, he was trying to teach us uh, about ourselves. And being out in nature was important. And the thing that I, one of the things I wanted to get to was the, uh, the first time we were crossing over a small stream and I looked around at the stream left and right, and I wanted to know where the, where the sewer grate was, where the water went, because that's all I had ever seen. When I saw water, it, it was along the curb in the street, and it would go down the street and into a sewer grate. And that's exactly what I looked for. I was like, but there's no sewer grates, you know. And I, I just, you know, I learned to love nature and uh, from a young age, like from, a, from that age. But because I was deprived of it as a kid, you know, I really, I really felt drawn to it and uh, always wanted to try to live in the country. But I was stuck in the city for 50 years, <laughs> except for camping trips. That's important for any kid in the city to get out there and... It's, it's crucial. Yeah, even for a week, once a year or so. Anything, anything, anything. Just to know that nature nature exists. There's a world of, uh, you know, harmony, a world where, where things grow, where human beings don't have to dominate everything, you know, where, where things just happen na naturally. You know, they just happen. Um, wind blows and, you know, there's a magic to nature that sometimes you don't get to see when you're looking at steel and glass, you know, you just don't get it. You know, one of the things I didn't like working at CBS was I was basically spending a lot of time in a windowless cubicle. I wanted to know what time of day it was 
how much light left there was outside. What was the temperature like? You know, I mean, it was just horrible. And so it was no big decision for me to leave CBS and go to buy a, a hotel and restaurant in the Catskills. It was, this is something I can do. Okay, I'm going to do it. Adios. You know, so we left, my wife and I and our two kids, you know, left, uh, left our careers, left our, sold our house and just moved up there. Somebody was talking about how most of the major metro areas, you know, New York City included, mm -hmm. are just paved over with very little trees or anything to reinforce man's dominance over nature. Because a lot of those came together back when nature was still kicking our ass. <laughs> People wanted to go to these cities where it was safer and it was easier and they had running water and they had sewers and... Indoor plumbing. Exactly. They have <laughs> all these, uh, you know, modern marvels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They didn't Just, have, uh, you know, coyotes stealing their chickens and, you know, fox running around and bears in the backyard. And It's kind of interesting because I, I looked at that, uh, you know, I dealt with all of that living in the Catskills. And uh, I felt like that's mischief. Uh, I didn't, it didn't bother me that much. You know what I mean? But human crime... You know, which I covered for a living. I mean, that's what I wrote about at the New York Post. I covered the mafia, crime, terrorism. Uh, it's a different, it's a different um, caliber. You know, it's not the mischief of the animal breaking into your dumpster, you know, or running off with your chicken. Uh, you can understand that, you know. Uh, but some of the things humans do to each other, I, I have a very hard time even understanding uh, the motivation. It's, I try. Uh, in fact, one of my first pr uh, jobs as a reporter, I had quit. It was right out of uh, college. I was working at the New York City Tribune, and I was still kind of young and impressionable enough, um, not a real sense of who I was. So I was writing about this uh, couple of crimes that were going on at the time. One of them was called the Spider-Man Rapist, and he was basically breaking into people's apartments through fire escapes, windows, through the windows, he would already target people. There would be couples. He would tie the guy up and rape the woman in front of the guy. That was his crime. And another one was the Mario Alito, the Mario Alito uh, crazy man who was he 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 went onto the Staten Island ferry with a machete and he just started cutting people up. So he had come from Cuba. I heard know, about that. When Castro let people out of his mental institutions. Cuban crime wave. So a couple of these things were going on and I was having to write about them. And because I was writing about them, I thought about them. And I was like, why would anybody do these things? You know, like I just couldn't understand. I, and I wanted to understand because I want to understand other people. And uh, it got to the point where I had to quit because one weekend, a few friends of ours uh, went, to, we went together to Jones Beach. And I thought, this is a great chance to get away from all of that, you know. So I'm laying down. We find this place, there's some dunes, and then over the dunes, you know, we got a little spot. So I laid down a towel, and I'm laying down, and my friends were frolicking by the water. And I imagined somebody climbing over the dunes with a knife coming, a gun, and shooting us and killing us. And I said, you know what? I can't. I just can't do this anymore. I, I had to leave. So I left journalism. I would rather the crime of the bear breaking into my dumpster any day. Where are the animals? Well, yeah, they say we, we give animals a bad name when we call each other animals, you know. <laughs> Which comes back to the issue of living in cities, you know. There's, uh, in the prophet, Gibran, Carlos Gibran talks about how out of fear we gather too closely together. We don't have enough space. Um, I think, you know, the fear of nature or the fear of any kind of disruption, any kind of, uh, you know, something out of our control, uh, created this this sense that we have to be huddled together you know and and maybe a bit too close and and, and what happens is like in new york city you you develop a, a external uh hard hardness that uh, you know and most new yorkers are really really nice people but that external shell because we're so close we have to you know protect ourselves from each other we have to have a distance somehow so we create a psychological distance and it's that hard shell, that outer shell that keeps us 
sane and, and gives us space from each other. Uh, because we're we're living so close together, some po- sometimes in some apartment buildings, you don't even know the person in the next apartment. They go to work at a different time you do. They have a different schedule. You never see them. You don't even know who they are. But you're living so physically close, but emotionally and socially very distant. Folks just don't do it anymore. I can remember where I grew up. Uh, we knew all the neighbors. Mm-hmm. Some of them, they're just around and people spoke to each other. Neighbors spoke to each other more often. <laughs> I remember I have vivid memories of being you know, a kid in Brooklyn and some of the experiences I had. One of them was the lady. She was the cat lady of the block, you know, and uh, we would go get the newspaper. We had to go a couple of blocks all away to get the newspaper for our neighbors, and they would give us a, a nickel for going to get it or something like that, you know. Uh, we would wait. It would be delivered uh, to the to – the, uh, It was a little shop that had like a malt shop kind of thing and then newspapers and, you know, that kind of stuff. So we would wait and the the truck would drop the papers off. The guy would get them, cut it open, and then we would grab a couple, buy them, and bring them to the neighbors. And this is an interesting dilemma, but we we, we would go to this lady's house and we never wanted to go in because whenever she opened the door, you got that whiff of cat. (laughs) <laughs> it was just overwhelming. So we would stand outside and give her the paper, and then she would give us a couple of pennies or whatever it was, and then we'd be happy, and we'd run along. And one day she said, come on in. I got to get you some money. We looked at each other like, oh, God, no. We don't want to go in there. You know, what? what's it going to be like? So we go in, and we're waiting for her in her you know, cramped apartment. There were, all the cats are jumping over everything, right? And uh, one of them jumps on my friend, and he's freaked out. And so <laughs> we're laughing. Uh, but we were in there probably about five minutes waiting for her to get the couple of pennies or whatever she was going to give us and for get, getting the paper for her. And then we went outside. And that's when we noticed that we didn't even notice this cat smell while we were in there. After a while, you don't notice. And it's an interesting thing about human beings. We could be in a situation and not realize it. You know, we don't realize we're in it. Uh, we get used to it. We get comfortable. And only when you get outside of it will you notice it. And I notice as, as that's something I noticed as a kid, you know, just from that one experience. That we can be in a really bad situation. That if, if we really thought about it, you know, if we really looked at it properly, we would never be in it. But we can get used to it. We can get comfortable. And, when, and we then fear coming out of it. And fear can hold us, you know, hostage in situations that we don't need to accept. Yeah, what were they calling that? Hedonistic adaptation. (laughs) Oh, like the people who get uh, uh, kidnapped uh, and they're held by their captors, Stockholm Syndrome. and Yeah, you you know, you adapt. But the problem with adapting can be that you might adapt too well, you know, and then you you don't even realize there's something else. So... Uh, your book, Beyond the Sphere, I enjoyed your story about how you and your friend used to fake stabbings in the park to show how careless people were. What's that, what's that famous story? Kitty Genovese, uh, the woman who got uh, raped and killed, I think, and nobody, it's a famous story. Uh, it was in New York City. Um, nobody bothered to help her. They heard the screaming and everything. They just you know shut the blinds, kind of one of those. It was a... Uh, one of those um, events that sort of was marked in the psyche of people for a long time. The, you know, the, the, the fact that this woman was out there getting killed and nobody had came to help her. They just shut, shut the blinds and mm-hmm. pretended they didn't hear it while it was happening. But uh, in the 70s in New York City, it was pretty rough. You know, it could get really gritty. And, uh, you know, I was one of these people, like I said, I... From a philosophical standpoint, I had a thing of, like, I w- wouldn't want to live in fear. So I, I would go to the Prospect Park alone sometimes. And uh, so one of the things me and my buddy Joe did was um, to show, to prove to ourselves that nobody gave a damn about anyone else, we would do that. We would go to the park and stage these fake uh, murders, muggings and murders, and and then uh, – laugh hysterically when the cars would pass by that just witnessed the whole thing. The drivers saw it and the passengers, they saw the whole thing. We knew they saw it. We staged it so they could not not see it, right? Not helping the tourism industry at all? No, 
and they would just keep driving. Well, this was in Prospect Park, which you didn't go to at night. You know, you didn't go to Prospect Park at night. Brooklyn? Yeah. Okay. It's just like the, the same uh, people who designed the uh, Olmstead, the same people that designed the uh, Central Park. They designed Prospect Park. It was a gorgeous park. But in the 70s, it was a dangerous place to be at night. The previous generations always told us how safe it was. They'd go out walking at night. They'd leave their doors open at night. And, you know, but by the 70s, when nobody was going out walking hand in hand in Prospect Park at night, and nobody was leaving their doors open. You know, we were very aware of crime. Those cops that saw you doing it and chased you, were they on foot or in a car? They came up in a car, and I heard them because I, the, I was the mugger, so I was already running. <laughs> and I heard them say, are you okay? And I was like, no one ever stopped. So this is the first time we actually heard a voice, right? So I turned back, and my friend is getting up from the ground, uh, who's supposed to be supposed to be stabbed and mugged and dying on the ground. He gets up, and now he starts running behind me, and we're running through the park. And the cops, the one that opened the rear uh, driver's side door, uh, closed. They got back in, and they got in the car, and they started riding on the grass through the hills in the park to come after us. Oh, they were <laughs> Oh, yeah, they weren't happy. And I knew, we both knew, if they catch us, we're going to catch a beating from these cops. They're going to kick our asses. Well, it was back in the days where they would totally do that. Yeah, they'd slap you around, pick you up, throw yeah. you around. Yeah, they would have definitely done it. So we we ended up hiding in some thicket, and we ended up with, like, scratches all over, muddy, dirty. <laughs> but at least we didn't get beat up by the cops. <laughs> I could sit here and tell you stories about James Brown and lots of criminals and you know, uh, snipers, killers, uh, you know, celebrities uh, from the years uh, as a journalist, right? And I was going to take 12 stories that I did for the Post, uh, two of them that I was nominated for the Pulitzer, right? That I mentioned that in the cover, I think. But um, about an exorcism that took place in a, a mental institution in Brooklyn. And it's like, you know, there's all kinds of fun stories about the lion. Were you there for that? No, no, no. I must thank God, no. But I wish, actually, I wish I would have seen it. It would have been very entertaining. But uh, it was the Kingsborough Psychiatric Center. It ended up, uh, I ended up getting a Pulitzer nomination for that because it um, ultimately revealed some serious problems in our state mental health system. Uh, that an exorcism was performed in a place as a cure, and then the state was billed like twelve thousand dollars for it. And it was, you know, it was, and it led to an investigation of uh, the criminally insane getting out easily and pushing people into subways, and you know, it was a mess. They invoiced the state for an exorcism. Yeah, it was a story grand? you couldn't. That's make what it up. costs for an exorcism. Twelve, I think it was twelve thousand eight hundred. And then the next day after I did that story, I got to interview the exorcist who wasn't returning my calls, but all of a sudden he wanted to talk after the story came out. And he told me that uh, he was worried because they didn't pay him that uh, for all the hard work he did to get these demons out. He said there were seven demons. He said he only charged them for six. He threw the seventh one out for free, and they stiffed him. And these demons are going to be coming back even worse than before because when they repossess, they're worse than the first time. Uh, it was a kind of a threat to the state uh, that he should get paid. Repossession. Repossession. That was actually the, that was actually the headline of the post. Will the, That's, will the exorcist is, repossess? <laughs> that is Pulitzer worthy. I love that. It was a great story. Oh it's goodness. a once-in-a-lifetime story you could not make up. You got to send me a link to that. I want to read that. You know, the f thing is, that was written around 93. I'm not sure they were online, those stories. I'm not sure. I mean, I might be able to get the library to get me a copy, like the Post has its own library. But I think they were not putting the, there wasn't any internet when I started uh, at the Post in 93. So many people are doing what you and I are doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many podcasts being recorded. Somebody said well, that's because the spoken word is now as powerful as the printed word. I saw that transition when I went from uh, print news to TV news. You know, I could I could see that from from that vantage point. Uh, that the printed word was very powerful. I, I started learning journalism on a typewriter. Okay, so <laughs> exactly. I've been through the whole thing, and then we uh, then we went to um, these CRT terminals. You know, with the green blinking uh, cursor. 
And but the, the amazing thing was co copy and paste. You were able to. Is, we actually used to cut and paste paper. In the early days, if you wanted to edit your story and move a paragraph up, you would cut and paste a paragraph and move the other paragraph down nice. with fit paper, and you would hand that in. You know that's how how it used to be. And then the CRT came, came out, and then you were able to cut, copy and paste, or move, cut and paste stuff. And that was like a revolution because it didn't take as much time to write. Now you had, you know, you could do it. You didn't like that, you you delete it. You know, before you had to type, and you know. Yeah, we had one that little screen above the typewriter. Yeah, yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> but the CRT was like you know, screen like that big, black pretty much, and then green letters and green cursor. And a keyboard attached to the thing, right? One unit. So that was an advance that came out. And then uh, we had those at the New York Post in the 90s, even when I got there. Uh, and then they went with uh, Microsoft, you know, Word or something that later, uh, which was a little more advanced than that, right? So, uh, and then, you know, going from print and then going to TV, uh, I saw that, you know, people have made sound and video. Um, the mode of choice, more or less, you know. I understand that, and I understand that people are busy and they want to multitask and they want to hear a book instead of read it. Uh, I might have to, you know, eventually get get to do a uh, an audio book version of this book. Oh, you got to do that right away. Yeah, I was yeah. like you know, looking at it and I was like, uh, come sit here and do it. I just, I, I tried reading. I, I did a little experiment at home and I would try to start reading. And then I would make a mistake and I'm like, oh, what, do I have to start all over again? And I don't have the equipment at home to, to you know, to do it. And then I could pay to have a service. It's, it's probably about, you know, four grand to get an audio book done. And they have someone like a professional reader, someone that you would pay to read the book or you could do it yourself. But like I said, it's it, it's something that's foreign foreign to me to some degree, but I thought it might be uh, uh, worth doing, but I, I wasn't sure how to go about it. Do I, do I do a professional thing? Do I try to do it in my own voice or hire somebody with a better voice, you know, to, to read it, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's sitting there and uh, not, not going anywhere right now. But yeah, the, the world has changed. I think we have, you know, we went through MTV. Uh, our attention spans are about like uh, three seconds. Uh, you know, people just don't have the time and, discipline or relaxation or whatever it takes to sit down with a book but we'll listen to a two or three hour podcast hmm. that's interesting because this book i've written it so uh concisely it could be read in two and a half hours cover to cover so anyway i would take those stories and basically tell how the story came about was it an anonymous phone call? Was it someone I met somewhere? You know, and just go through the story from the beginning to the end and what happened. And then go on to chapter two of the next story, another story. And just take that story from like John Gotti having throat cancer, dying of throat cancer. That was a big story. It was the front page. It was one of those stop the presses things where at 11 o'clock at night I called, the, I called my editor and said, you got to change the front page. You know, so, so I have like, I have a lot of stories, but I figured I'd take about a dozen you know, and just tell the stories. And it would be a good book for the public to see how j journalism is supposed to be done, okay, as opposed to what's going on today, which is writing press releases for the government, you know. Uh, so show the public how journalism was, and also it could be used in journalism schools. It could be a, a, a book that could be used to teach as well, you know. So I thought it would be a good book. But, and then I, this thing has been, you know, that happened in 1980 has always been with me and uh i decided you know should i try to write that you know which turned out to be this book and i said if i had six months left to live you know which one of these would i write because i'm going to choose one of them and i said this is the one i have to write because if i died and i didn't write it i'd be very upset if i li if if there was an afterlife i would be very upset that i didn't tell that story you know, so I, so I did, I set about doing it. And then I had a friend of mine and I asked him cause I helped him write his book. I said, you know, what kind of computer, what kind of laptop should I get? And this and that, you know, so I ended up getting a, you know, a Mac, MacBook and, and learning 
to use that. And, um, you know, I would do a chapter and, and put it on Google Docs and he would look at it and he'd give me feedback. And that's how I did it. And it was written basically in two weeks. That's how fast it came out. Thank you for listening to the Creative Loitering Podcast. Don't forget to ring the bell and subscribe and like and comment below and enable notifications and click the heart and leave a review and swipe right at Patreon and OnlyFans and make a donation and follow me on Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter and WhatsApp and WeChat and TikTok and QQ and QZone and Reddit and Twitch and YouTube and Vimeo and Pinterest. And- like there's someone in a bathtub playing a saxophone (laughs) there should be video of this that should exist so i just got it on my iphone oh okay i saw that and i was like oh my god my i sound so rusty it sounded fine it was just um no most of the world has never seen that before it was cold did you see the picture of me in a whole suit going into that bathtub soaking wet no it's making a big splash Uh, there's all kinds of shoots we've done with that. She said, okay, you get in there. And I, I was like, it was cold water in the damn thing. They filled it with the garden hose. <laughs> I had to roll my pants up. and So I'm freezing. And it's, you know, it's good. I was like, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll just do whatever you guys want to get the picture. We've gotten some really fun shots of, yeah. of uh, in that bathtub. I'm like, here you go. That, that exists now. Saxophone mm-hmm. in the bathtub. There you go.